I'm Kimberly Kaler, and I'm here to talk to you today about corporate mindfulness. I have a background as a corporate executive uh, doing consulting work, everything from marketing to event planning and association management. And then I also happen to be a yoga teacher. So I love it when those two worlds intersect and I'm excited to talk to you today about a topic that is near and dear to me. Now I've talked about corporate mindfulness for years, but this is the first time I've talked about it since the pandemic started. And I'm interested to share with you maybe some insights related to how all of this applies in our pandemic and maybe our post-pandemic world. So starting out with first, um, it's important to look at how connection, our relationships to technology, our connection to technology has completely taken over. So if you think back to the days when we used to stand in line, um, you know, maybe say hello to a neighbor, say hello to the people around us, maybe look around, daydream. We don't daydream anymore. We typically pull out our phones and we scroll through mindlessly looking at things. Whenever there's a moment of pause, we pull out our cell phones. And I invite you to think about that too in terms of what you do when you're watching TV at night, when you're binging on Netflix or Hulu, are you able to do it without your phone in your lap, without mindlessly scrolling? So that insistence on um, this uh, you know, connection that we have with always feeding our brain and multitasking is something that we've trained our brains to expect. No problem, right? You may have said, I'm really great at multitasking. And interestingly enough, studies show that women are actually better at multitasking than men. But before us women celebrate that and say how fantastic that is, I want to share with you that there's a lot of downsides to multitasking. And if you've trained your brain to be a good multitasker, I hope what you come out of this presentation with is the importance of actually reprogramming our brain. We're gonna talk a lot about brain science because multitasking is actually you know, really tough on us, on our body, on our systems, on our mind. So what does multitasking do? It leaves many of us tired, sluggish, cranky, quick to react, um, worrisome in that state or fight or flight, which we'll talk more about. So when we talk about mindfulness, this may be something you relate to, especially during the pandemic during this last year, in which you may have been caring for children um, at home, handling schoolwork, maybe elder care, uh, balancing a job in a different location and then where you typically work. Um, even if you were going into an office setting as usual, nothing was as usual. So very, very different scenarios that have played out in the last year. So we're going to do one quick exercise here, and I want you to go ahead and grab a pencil and paper. I'll give you a moment to do that. And then once you have your pen and paper, we're going to actually write, and don't start yet, my overachievers, please stop. You're going to be writing, I am a great multitasker, and then write down the numbers 1 through 20 right after. So just spelling out I'm a great multitasker and then write down the numbers, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. And I'm gonna pull out my phone because I'm actually going to time us on a stopwatch here. So on the count of three, I'll go ahead and count you down and you will go ahead and get started. Again, writing out, I'm a great multitasker and then writing down the numbers one through 20. So on your marks, get set and go. So if we were all together, I'd ask once you're done for you to go ahead and just peek your head up, um, put your pencil down. But since we're doing this via Zoom, I'm gonna make a guess as to when I think you'll be done. We're at 15 seconds now. Rounding out at around 20. We are coming up to 30. And I'll go ahead and stop it about right here at 35 seconds. That's about typical of where most start when we do this exercise. Now we're gonna try this again to test your multitasking skills. You are going to this time write out the words and letters, I am a great multitasker and the numbers, but you're gonna go back and forth between the two. So letter, number, letter, number. So I, one, A, two, M, three, A, four, G, five, et cetera. Letter, number, letter, number. Once you're done, you would look up. Again, I'm going to stop where I think most of us are when I've done this exercise so many times and I'll go ahead and count you down. 
three, two, one, we have started. And we are at 15 seconds. Twenty five seconds. Thirty five, which is where we stopped for the original exercise. And we are now at forty five and you may not even be done yet when I've done this oftentimes we go up to a minute, maybe even a minute 15 before we stop. So what we can learn from this. First, I'd like you to go ahead and look at the statement, the numbers, see if there's any errors. Pretty common to actually have errors, um, maybe not. So congratulations if, there, if it's not. And then you know, think back about how long it took you to do it. So when I first learned this exercise at a mindfulness conference, I just thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread because I did it really quickly put my pencil down, looked around. I was like, awesome. I am such a great multitasker. And as I celebrated there, my, my ego right there, um, I quickly learned that it's not something to celebrate. So if you are quick to do it, it shows that you've actually trained your brain, that your brain needs to be multitasking all the time, that your brain needs several different inputs and you're not capable of concentrating just on one thing. So I, the great exercise to do maybe with friends and family to play with, maybe other coworkers, just to talk through this whole concept related to multitasking. So multitasking, it's about balance, but it's a myth. You can do it all, but it's a lot better if we can do it in a sequence. So the downside related to um, efficiency with multitasking is it does hinder innovation and creativity. Lots of studies in the last couple of years showcasing that we no longer brainstorm, we no longer daydream. Again, because with this connection with technology, we're always feeding inputs. So that does hinder innovation. It's why companies like Apple and 3M have actually earmarked time to um, have innovation, to have brainstorming, have just play, if you will. Kills the sense of prioritization. If our brain is always multitasking, not knowing where to move forward with um, you know, what to do next. And then decreasing quality as well, also something that is a, a real challenge. And then shrinking your brain. This is where the brain science comes in. And this is a topic that I absolutely love, understanding how the brain works. Um, we'll talk a lot more about the brain. But you, you know, when you're multitasking, you actually are shrinking your brain and how it's wired. And here we go, rewires your brain. So what do we do with all that? How do we unbundle it? So 46% of the time, your brain is actually thinking about an activity that you're not doing which is fascinating. And I think if you're a multitasker, that number is probably a lot higher. So think about how dangerous that is, that we're not actually focused on the thing at hand, the thing that we're doing. The more that you pay attention, the stronger the prefrontal cortex gets. So what does that mean? It means that our brain actually, we're training our brain, we're rewiring our brain when we're actually focusing on something. And the thicker that prefrontal cortex, the better we are in terms of decision-making. And that impacts problem solving, our ability to relate to others, communication, creativity, relationships. Wow. So it impacts that as well, too. There's an old saying in neuroscience that neurons that fire together wire together. Well, what does that mean? Think back to if you learn to play an instrument, that whole practice makes perfect. We're creating those brain pathways. Um, I remember learning as a kid that, you know, we create little dents in our brain in terms of how we're learning to do things. And that is key. So that goes to both good things and bad things. And that's real important to know in terms from a mindfulness standpoint. The ability to learn is about strengthening these neural connections. Um, it's also about getting rid of things that we don't need anymore, what that pruning process is. So what do we mean by that? So here's our brain, and we have connections between the neurons. These connections are... Um, these are the connections that neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, other chemicals that we need for fight or flight, for movement, for adrenaline, um, for concentration, travel across and through the body. 
There's also the glial cells, which act to speed up signals between the neurons. And then these cells are the waste removers as well. So they prune your connection. So what the heck do we mean by that? Which ones do we know to prune? So researchers are just starting to unravel this mystery, but they have found that there's actually a connection between what we use in our brain and what we don't use. So for example, if you're always having negative thoughts about something, that brain pathway, that's practice makes perfect. Your brain knows how to get to that negative thought really fast. Your brain has a harder time finding that positive thought, that positive emotion, that positive feeling. So at night, when our brains help, um, when our, our bodies help us uh, rest, digest, clean out our systems, we actually go through a, a brain cleansing, if you will. And those access, those thoughts that we don't access quite yet by marked by this protein, this C1Q. So when the cells detect that mark, they bond to the protein and then they destroy or prune that synapse. And this is how your brain makes physical space for you to build new and stronger connections each day. So as you can imagine, you want your brain to actually keep the good stuff, the good thoughts, the, the brainstorming, the knowledge you have and get rid of the negative ones. If you've ever realized, you know, thought about how, how fast you got to a negative thought or how fast you got to a space when somebody said something and you immediately went like that to a negative space, that's what this is. Your brain has marked it pretty quickly. So if you ever felt like your brain was full, and I'll move my picture here so we can see the slide better, uh, maybe when you're starting a new job or you're deep into a project, and in a way, your brain actually is full. I mean, our brain only has so much room. We can only remember so much. So your brain needs to find ways to actually prune those connections and build a more streamlined and efficient pathways. So our brain does what it does this when we sleep. So your brain cleans itself out when you sleep and your brain cells shrink up to about 60% to create space for that waste. Um, you know, again, things marked by that protein are actually cleansed out at night. So if you've ever woken up from a good night's sleep and you felt like you could really just think clearly, um, you know, that the whole idea of I'm gonna go to bed and think about it, or I'm not gonna make a decision tonight, I'll see if it becomes clear in the morning. And oftentimes it does. That's our brain's process of clearing out the clutter and hopefully things come together, leave you room to synthesize new information, in other words, learn. When we're thinking with a sleep deprived brain or a brain that's always being fed negativity or too much stimuli because we're multitasking, it says, it says here, going through a dense jungle with a machete. I mean, slow going, exhausting, um, you know, hard for the brain to actually function. So you actually have control over what your brain deletes, what gets marked for the recycling. Um, so it's really care important for us to be mindful that we're thinking about. So taking this to a work situation, if your mind is constantly ruminating over a fight or you know, maybe an uncomfortable conversation you had with a coworker or something about a particular project you're dreading, you're gonna actually create those brain pathways to get to that negative thought in a quicker time frame. If you think back right now to maybe situations in your life, I'm sure you can come up with some examples of this applies. So how does all this reply, reply or, or relate to business? Well, obviously we live in a complicated world right now, um, especially as it relates to the pandemic. Business today, the environment requires us to face a range of ever-changing challenges. And boy, we faced a lot of challenges in the last 15 months or so, um, making decisions in a stressed and unstable environment. Talk about unstable. So much has been out of our control in the last you know, year, year and a half. So these feelings of uncertainty can undermine decisions, lead to costly mistakes, leave us haphazard, leave us multitasking, trying to set priorities, and we just create this vicious cycle. Um, vicious cycle, vicious pattern, and again, programming our brains this way. We know that stress actually uh, manifests itself and actually hinders performance at work. Um, those organizations that are able to reduce stress and have a focus on mindfulness-based practices have been shown to improve their profitability, to in, um, improve their innovation, their collaboration. So all really important attributes for, for organizations to look at, probably now more than ever. 
how do we solve these problems? Well, we could fix the business world and all the stresses that are in it and our political climate and, and social unrest and, the, and we do need to work towards all of those things. Um, but a baby step we can take is really something for ourselves, for our coworkers in terms of stress reduction and meditation and mindfulness techniques. So what do we mean by mindfulness? Well, let's talk about mindfulness as um, you know, how it relates to business. And it is a hot topic. Um, why? A couple of years ago, Time actually claimed it was the year of mindfulness as it was starting to gain traction in a lot of business settings. Benefits are um, self-awareness, decision-making, innovation, compassion, courage, resilience in the workplace. All of these things are benefits from a mindfulness set um, attitude in a work setting. MBSR, a mindfulness-based stress reduction, is a potential candidate. It's used quite a bit in counseling and psychology circles now, and it also works well in professional business environments. It's also showing up in the boardroom. Um, Google offers um, a mindfulness type of program. We see it quite a bit growing in the educational sectors, um, teaching children at a young age how to pause, to breathe, to be mindful about what they're doing. Um, and again, they're, they're, we'll talk about this, but there's no religious connotations. Um, there's no dogma associated with this. And I think that's real important to understand is a lot of times there's misunderstandings related to mindfulness or a yoga practice or some sort of religious agenda. And then even Congress has had some MBSR type of trainings and activities that are intended to create um, a Maya mindful approach to um, their work and their activities. So when we look at um, mindfulness and how it started out, it does have its roots in Taoism and Buddhism, but again, how we apply it does not have to have any sort of religious dogma um, or understanding principles in any way. Um, what we're taking from it is the ability to um, be mindful about what we're doing. Mindful meditation and other practices are now widely accepted. They're used quite a bit in clinical settings and healthcare, et cetera. So benefits, avoiding burnout. That's a key one, especially as we enter um, this next phase, more of us are returning to offices, um, you know, handling things because we've, we've been challenged during this last year. Our environment has so much been out of our control. Many of us are burned out. Managing stress. I don't think I need to talk much about that. I think that's self-explanatory and we, we've all uh, been challenged there too. Enhancing leadership cap capacity. If you, you know, read articles about leaders, um, leaders of Fortune 100 companies, they all tend to have some sort of mindfulness practice. They tend to read a lot. Um, you've likely read or maybe gone to workshops or seminars where they talk about secrets to success, such as closing your email and only checking it one or twice a day, being very diligent about how you structure things. I know those suggestions are easy to, to make and they're a lot harder to implement, but maybe considering, um, you know, looking at them from a mindfulness perspective and see if any of those could actually fit into your world. Steady minds in the midst of making important decisions, career transition. If you think of those that are calm, cool, and collected in your life, um, how do they do it? You know, is there anything you can learn from them in terms of how they approach things? But it goes beyond reducing stress to also looking at what matters and what matters most to you. So mindfulness is a full awareness of being present right now. So again, training our brain, going back to instead of mulling over the past, I should have never sent that email. I should have never hit, you know, CC to everybody. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Um, you know, try and do what's called face and replace in the psychology sector or counseling world. Um, it, okay, negative thought and negative things happen. When that thought comes up and bubbles up, how can I replace it? Oh, I should have never sent that email. Replace it with, I have a great opportunity at the meeting tomorrow for everyone to show what we're working on. You know, easy for me to say, but this is where practice makes perfect again. I encourage you to try and practice and replace those negative thoughts. I know I won't get that promotion. Well, chances are you won't if you go in with that negative mindset, face and replace. I know I won't get that promotion too. I've been working really hard and I think that my work is going to be noticed and my opportunity is coming. So mindfulness involves stilling that chatter in the here and now. 
I like to share this graphic because it causes me to pause and it reminds me to practice when I what I preach. So I have a seven year old French bulldog. And when I got him and I was starting to take him on walks, um, I would have my phone out, um, you know, because I was away from my desk and hadn't had a dog before. So I wasn't used to being away from the desk and the phone or whatever. So taking him on a walk, I'd be texting, I'd be on the phone and I'm not really sure how he got this mindfulness bug um, or it's just the universe kind of slapping me in the face and, and reminding me to practice what I preach. But he, if I was on my phone, he would actually put his, you know, pause down and stop where he was at and just sit until I was ready to move on. And if I'd put my phone away and we could move on on our walk, everything was good. So, you know, he's, he was a good reminder to me. Kids are a good reminder of this. Again, you know, do we have to be multitasking all the time? The emails, the work was still there 10 minutes later when I got back. But boy, I sure was a lot more centered and grounded by the lessons for my dog to stop for a second, look around, um, see where I was, and um, move forward without multitasking all the time. So thanks to my little Dexter for that. So no overthinking or overanalyzing, um, you know, too often there's this misconception when we talk about mindfulness or meditation, there's this thought and this picture of us sitting on, you know, yoga mats with um, our hands up here, ready to chant, we're sitting cross-legged and we have to banish all thoughts in our mind, which is actually pretty near impossible to do. Um, and I... I don't encourage anyone to even try it. What I want you to do is get a handle of the thoughts that come in, see how we can face and replace them and move them out um, in a mindfulness type of setting. So mindfulness being both a process as well as an outcome that we're looking for. So how does this also impact our body? Well, worrying actually um, activates our sympathetic nervous system or that fight or flight system, which I've already mentioned a little bit. So if we think back to how we are programmed as human beings, um, our bodies, our minds don't know that we no longer live in caves. They no longer, our bodies don't know that we're not being chased by bears and tigers anymore, for the most part, hopefully you aren't. Um, so when we get that stress response, whether it's an email from somebody, maybe it's a phone call from um, somebody, a family member you're not getting along with, whatever it is, that cortisol, that stress response that runs through our body is the same as if we were running away from the tiger back in the you know, beginning of time. So the cortisol goes through our body. Interestingly enough, our digestion shuts off too. So if you think about it, if you were an early homeo sapien and you were running away from tigers, you don't want to go to the bathroom. So um, your body shuts down your digestion. And so when we're in this stress response and the average human in the US has these stress impulses all day long and gets these shots of cortisol that allow us to run, that allow us to react, that allow us to have quick reaction time, shut down our digestion. That cortisol takes 40, 24 to 48 hours to actually leave your body. So think of the number of times you get that stress response during the day. And if we're not calming our systems down, we're just going from stress response to stress response, that cortisol actually um, creates belly fat. Um, cortisol is one of the leading causes of that. Um, all sorts of digestive issues. If our di digestion is being shut down, obviously it, it leads to digestion issues. So we need to get our body into a system where we've got um, in our parasympathetic nervous system, which is um, where our rest and digest is. And we already talked a lot about the importance of sleep and what happens in sleep in terms of reprogramming the brain, getting rid of the bad stuff, hopefully keeping the good stuff. Well, that rest and digest is also part of all of that in terms of reprogramming our nervous system. So people that practice mindfulness can actually change the structure of our brains. We've talked about cleaning our brains, understanding it, but change the structure, beefing up that access to the emotions and the stress responses. And what does that mean? It allows us to have that access to keeping cool, controlling the release of those hormones, et cetera. And that's why mindfulness can mean the difference between freaking out and keeping cool. So body-wise, it's also important to understand that that stress response actually creates havoc in your body. 
So the links between mindfulness um, and reductions in our blood pressure, our heart rate and inflammation are, are key. Lots of studies to show that. Practice has also shown to aid chronic fatigue sufferers, um, help also with irritable bowel syndrome. Again, if our digestion shuts down, chances are you may be a victim of irritable bowel syndrome. Can shrink belly fat, talked about that cortisol, um, help also with pain tolerance. So how do we get started with all of this stuff? Talked about reprogramming our brain, the face and replace. All great, Kimberly, but how do I actually get moving off onto this topic? Maybe start first with just a five minute exercise and a five is too much. Um, I actually would love to redo the slide and just say, maybe we start with one minute. There's some great apps and timers out there. One is called Insight Timer. It used to be free. I'm not sure if it still is anymore, but actually sit down in a comfortable space. You don't have to create any sort of yoga pose of, um, you know, in any way. And don't go in with the conception you need to banish thoughts from your mind. But just sit in focus, maybe bring attention to your breath. A great exercise is simply to count up, inhale for the count of three, and then exhale three, two, one. So maybe counting up and then counting backwards down again and just slowing your breath down is a great thing to do, bring some attention. And then noticing as your mind wanders where it goes and can you practice that face and replace? Negative thought, I'm gonna flip it with a good thought. And it's gonna be hard at first, but you'll get better at it. Again, practice makes perfect. So establishing that universality of the, of the wandering mind. Another thing to do is be more present and aware of the activities you're doing. So going back to what we talked about at the very beginning in terms of multitasking, how can you focus just on what you're doing? One of the things I learned in my mindfulness training um, as a yoga teacher was an exercise related to washing the dishes. So instead of washing the dishes while you're talking to your family with the TV on behind and you're thinking about tomorrow's to-do list and you're doing this and that, just noticing how the warm suds feels on your hands and how it starts to get cooler and seeing the bubbles and what it feels like to you know, scrub the pan. May sound silly, but a great exercise. Noticing your sense of smell. See if you can actually engage all of your smells, touch or senses. You know, can you even see things? You can smell things. Can you hear anything? Can you hear the bubbles? Sometimes you can't. So playing with practicing that just to calm down for a minute, chances are it'll be pretty soothing for you, even if you only spend a minute doing it. And then looking around, maybe in your office setting, as you're walking to your meeting, could you leave a minute early and take a moment to actually look out the window, the window you pass every day and never peek out. Could you take a moment to just pause, look at how the light is coming across your desk? What are some simple things that maybe you can pause and take note of? Um, following that exercise with the breath, inhaling up for a count of three, exhaling and coming down for a count of three. Um, you know, that's also a really great exercise that you can play with before you walk into that meeting just to find some sort of centering. Getting centered before you get knocked off your access. So start bringing that focus into real life situations. Um, just mentioned, you know, finding a moment of peace before that meeting, um, finding that breath, um, remaining in the moment. Another tip, um, something that I try and check myself in, if I notice a stress response, um, especially if I get from a particular person. So if I an email pop in, and, you know, history shows me that when I get an email from this person, my shoulders go up to like this and I feel the tension in my neck and my shoulders and my body. Um, how can I stop, stop that? How can I be aware of what happens in my body when something happens? And then how can I maybe process it? So I haven't even read the email yet and I've already had a negative reaction, a negative reaction that I've programmed in my brain. So how can I stop for a moment? And I'll actually have a little conversation with myself saying, Hey, I don't even know what Joe's going to say. Let's just open it and be an open mind and see where this is going to go. So remaining in that moment. So as final thoughts, life is what happens to you while you're busy and making other plans. If you learned anything from today, I hope it's not to celebrate multitasking. Um, chances are we're going to continue to be asked to multitask more and more. And we all became master multitaskers in the last year. Um, see if you can unplug. Just watch TV at night. Just read the book. Put your phone away, um, even if it's a half an hour. Um, and also to start small. Don't go cold turkey on things. Start small. Sit and, and um, you know, try to be mindful about something for a minute.
And maybe next week you can play with moving it to a minute and a half or two. Start small and build from there. Create those habits. We know it takes 30 to 45 days to create a habit. So moving forward um, in a meaningful way, remembering that you do have the ability to control, change, reprogram your brain, which I think is just awesome. So thank you. And I wish you all well, health and happiness. Thank you.